Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom, validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology, to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different, each guest is unique, each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Have you ever had a thought about something you would like to be, have or change in your life? And without much effort on your part, within hours or days, that thing or situation has manifested? It's a miracle, you said. Well, maybe not. Truth is, you are much more powerful than you think you are. Many ancient spiritual and esoteric teachings have been revealing this truth to us for millennia. And yet, our stubborn ego rejects what it can't understand, saying, show it to me, when I see it, I'll believe it. Well, its wish, the wish of many people's calling for the scientific evidence of their innate power, has now come true. Science has met spirituality. The evidence is there. It still requires a bit of imagination, as not everything is visible to the naked eye, but nonetheless, it is there. The power of intention is no longer magic, but a fact of life. There is no better person to unpack and explain all this to us than my very special guest today, Lynn McTaggart. Lynn is a best-selling author, thought leader, and spiritual change agent who has been examining the bridge between science and spirituality for the past 20 years. She is the architect of the Intention Experiment, an online global laboratory, testing the power of intention of large numbers of people put together to affect the physical reality across the world. Lynn is the award-winning author of seven books, including The Field, The Intention Experiment, The Bond, and The Power of Eight, which have been translated into some 30 languages. She is the co-founder of the international magazine What Doctors Don't Tell You and the health expo Get Well. A highly sought-after public speaker, Lynn is considered to be one of the world's 100 most influential people in the field of spirituality and has been featured on many key media, TV and radio shows worldwide. She also has her own podcast, Living the New Science. And now Lynn joins me from London. Hello, Lynn. Welcome to Quantum Living. Oh, it's such an honor and pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you so much, Anna. It's great to be here. To set the scene for this conversation, could you please share with us what sparked your insight about the power of thought, emotions, and intentions, which had subsequently put you on this path of the intersection of science and spirituality? And I understand that your background is uncommon in this field. Yes, I began life as an investigative reporter. In my 20s, I was busting baby selling rings uh, with hidden tape recorders and uh, cameras. And I wanted to put bad guys into jail. I got interested sometime later in the whole idea of spiritual healing. After my husband and I launched our publication, What Doctors Don't Tell You, because we were studying a lot of the science around medicine 
and we kept coming across very good studies of spiritual healing. And I kept thinking to myself, if you can have a thought and send it to someone else, that undermines everything we think about how the world works. So I set out trying to find out why. I thought I was going to find something simple like human energy fields that exist. And I spoke to a number of frontier scientists who had been doing work in consciousness research. That work and that investigation became my book, The Field, because what I discovered soon was that each of these scientists in their own little way, in their own experimental work, were uncovering what amounts to a completely new view of the world, a completely new science. So I wrote that up in the field, and it talked about the idea that we're all part of a giant quantum energy field at its heart. And it talked about many other things, about how our brains aren't the repository of information, but accessing information from this field and sending information to the field. And that our bodies at the most elementary are subatomic particles doing an energy dance with other subatomic particles in the world, and that this is a communication medium. But after I published that book, there was a bit of unfinished business, which was some experimental evidence showing that thoughts are not only things, but things that affect other things. And the investigator in me, the reporter in me, wanted to find out how far we can take this. So I started to think, you know, are we talking about a subtle effect, like just shifting a quantum particle? Or are we talking about huge effects, curing cancer, flying, whatever? How far could we take this? So I thought to myself, well, maybe I could test this because the field was in 30 languages by then. So I thought, well, I have a lot of readers out there. And also, I know a lot of these scientists working in consciousness research at prestigious universities like Princeton or University of Arizona, University of California, Penn State, etc. And I thought, well, if I just put them together, I'll have the biggest global laboratory in the world. And I wasn't just interested in intention. I was interested in group intention. What happens if lots of people are thinking the same thought at the same time? So in 2007, I published my book, The Intention Experiment, which was all about the science of all of intention that exists right now, but also it was an invitation for people to join me in these periodic experiments. And that's really how we got started. And we are now 40 experiments later. We've done everything from trying to make seeds grow faster, to purifying water, to lowering violence in war-torn or violent areas, to healing someone of PTSD, and of those 40 experiments, 36 have shown measurable, positive, mostly significant effects. Wow, I titled this episode, The Power of Intention as this is the concept I think most people associate with you and your work, following obviously the famous book, The Intention Experiment, and most notably the famous online intention experiments anyone could participate in that you just mentioned. So that's what I would like to focus on. But before I ask you to speak to those experiments, I'd like to invite you, if you could please unpack and explain the power of intention as a concept and phenomenon. What is it and how does it work from the scientific point of view? And what key aspects are involved, such as any particular emotional states and attributes for this to work? Okay. So first of all, we have to understand that we are not solid things. We're something more than chemistry and electrical signaling. What I un uncovered and wrote about in my book, the field 
was discoveries, and these aren't new discoveries. These were discovered in the 1980s. The idea that all living things send out tiny packets of light. Dr. Fritz Albert Popp, the late German physicist, discovered this, and he found that this light emanates from DNA, and it is, number one, like a central controller in the body and a communication medium. So it sends light out to different parts of the body, almost like a signaling director. It also is global. If you put medicine, for instance, on one part of your hand, the light will change there, but it'll also change elsewhere too. It's like the light is saying, hey guys, we have something else here we have to pay attention to. So he also discovered, aside from being a communication medium and conductor inside the body, it's also a communication medium outside the body. Not only human beings, but all living things, he discovered, are sending out this light, and it's being replied to synchronicitously. So he found this with animals and also humans, that there's a two-way communication that goes on with this light. Now, what he discovered, too, and what other scientists have discovered after him, is that certain conditions increase this light or decrease the light. Not only physical conditions like cancer or multiple scler sclerosis change the light, but also when you are doing something like healing. Dr. Gary Schwartz, noted psychologist at the University of Arizona, discovered when doing studies using a special equipment that ordinarily just records very, very faint light in outer space. He used it to measure these photons coming out of the hands of healers when they were sending intention for healing. And he found when they did, the light increased hugely. We've also found other energy increases when we have a thought for healing, when we're sending healing. So it may well be that what we're doing is sending out coherent light. By coherent light, that means some of the most powerful light that exists out there. Ordinarily, if you could see my hands, you'd see that light has a lot of waves that are discordant. They're not all waving with the same amplitude all the time. And they're going in opposite ways, waving in opposite waves. When light is coherent, it's waving all at the same time together. All those light waves are working like a marching band perfectly in step. And when that happens, the light increases exponentially. And so we have some evidence that thought is coherent light. And that's what's going on. There are many conditions for doing intention. And I, this is what I teach. I feel that there are seven key intention essentials. And there are actually 13 in total. So for beginners, I teach seven. For more experienced people moving on to level two, I teach 13 in total. But you asked about a few keys. Number one is telling the universe exactly what you want. You know, most people aren't very specific in what they intend for. They'll intend for, I want to be rich, for instance. And they don't necessarily mean they want to be rich. And they certainly haven't specified how rich. How much money do you want to have in the bank? What they usually mean is, I hate my job and I want something else and better. Or I don't want to work so hard. Or I want to work less and have more time for my children or my grandchildren or my hobbies. They don't necessarily want a lot of stuff. Almost nobody who has a lot of stuff finds happiness from just that stuff that. I was just watching a couple of videos the other day by Jim Carrey and also Matthew McConaughey, both saying the same thing, that money and in the end did not bring them happiness. So I don't think it's about being rich. I think it's about being something else. So people don't specify what they want. So that's part of what I teach. 
is helping people determine what it is they're actually sending. The other thing you have to recognize is we're not just intending for the half hour that we hold that intention during our meditation. We're intending all day and all night long. We have about 70,000 thoughts a day. And those thoughts are also beaming out. And all of those thoughts, all of those judgments we hold, all that negativity we send, all of those, uh, that flotsam and jetsam that goes through our heads, every last mendacious thought, that is also an intention. And together it becomes our life's intention. Yes. There is the most important piece of this of, of all. And that is the idea that you don't do it alone. You do it in a group. One of the things that I have discovered from 2007 is that thoughts and intentions magnify and be supersize in a group of any size. So after I started doing the intention experiments about a year later, I thought, what if I brought this into a workshop? And I wasn't really sure how to do this. So I was kicking this around with my husband and my team one day. And I said, well, I don't know, I'll put them in groups of eight or so maybe. And I'll have them send healing intention to a member of the group with a health challenge. And I assumed that that would just be a nice feel good effect. So we tried it with that first workshop in Chicago in 2008. We put people into groups, we had them send healing intention to a member of the group with a health challenge. We then had them finish for the day, had them come back. Once again, I asked them how it was for them, thinking they're going to say it was like getting my back rubbed or having a facial, a nice relaxing exercise. That's not what happened. What happened is people showed up, people like one woman who had been limping all weekend with very bad arthritis in her knee was walking normally that day. Then we had somebody else who had serious depression, she told us, and it felt lifted that day. Somebody else with very bad gut issues, um, irritable bowel syndrome or, um, or inflammatory bowel disease, said her gut felt normal for the first time in years. And somebody else who had cataracts said they felt like they were 80% better. So I was taken aback by this. And I was actually alarmed because, you know, I'm very, very wedded to evidence. And I thought, wait a minute, this must be a placebo effect. I'm not sure I believe this. And I thought it might undermine my serious work, my work with intention experiments. But I was intrigued enough to start working with this. And I brought it into every workshop and conference ever since. And by now I've seen thousands of healings. Um, to people who have got out of their wheelchairs, people who had stage four cancer, where the cancer was reversed. I was just talking to one of my retreat members the other day, and she told me she had stage four cancer, almost didn't come to the retreat last year, and went. Her group there did an intention for her, and that propelled her on a course of healing. That started turning the cancer around, she's now completely cured without the use of chemo and all of those other things. So what I've seen is the most powerful element of intention of all is the power of a group. Okay, thank you so much. And yes, we will talk a bit more about the difference between a large group and a small group, because this is one of the curious points that I would like to unpack. But at this point, I would like to pick up on a couple of things that you have said just a moment ago. When you spoke about light being projected and received, what we can understand, given that it creates some effect in our reality, in our consensus reality, that this light carries information 
So that information obviously creates changes in our reality. And the second, just very quickly, point I would like to pick up on is when you talk about being very specific in our intention, and I actually agree with this point of view. However, it might be worthwhile for the benefit of our listeners to point out that there are actually two schools of thought within the spiritual development and spiritual science community in terms of what to focus on and how to focus on with our intention when we want to manifest something in the quantum field. One says, be very specific, but then the other school of thought says, well, actually, no, don't be too specific because if you are, then you are shutting potentially other doors through which the universe might deliver what you really wanting. And I have a sense that the difference is not so much between a specific focus or the detail versus broad intention, but more so, which you have alluded to, to know exactly what is that we want. So I want more money is not really a powerful intention. I want to have more freedom in my life and more choices. That is getting a bit more to the level of specificity that then the universe will know what to do with it in terms of what is that we really want. And this freedom might come through not necessarily more money, but through other ways into our life. So I'd like to ask for your thoughts about those two schools of thought, again, in terms of having a specific intention versus a bit more open and broad intention. We actually tested this in our intention experiments. As I mentioned, we've done many experiments now, 40 of them. And I in, I did a series of water experiments, trying to purify water in various locations with different kinds of scientists and different kinds of experiments. And we have tried to be very specific. We'd like the water to uh, become more alkaline by at least one pH. And we've been very general. And the general ones are among the four that didn't work. <laughs> so we actually tested it. Now, this whole idea that, yeah, we'll let, you know, we won't be specific. We'll let the universe decide. That's very much like prayer in my mind, which is thy will be done. God, you decide for me. There's nothing wrong with that. And prayer works for a lot of people, but it's not intention. Intention is a very focused thought. And in my mind, I have never seen us limit ourselves by holding a specific intention. As you said, it's not very clear what you want. Now, I try to drill down even further. If somebody said, I want more freedom, I will ask them to say, in what? What do you want freedom? Do you want to break up with your partner? Do you want more freedom in your job? Do you mean that you don't want to see your children as much as you have to? Or what is it that you're talking about with freedom? Or free time? Is that what it is? So, you know, I'm a reporter by nature. And we were taught the five W's and H, who, what, when, where, why, and how. That had to go into the first paragraph <laughs> of every story. So I take some of them <laughs> and I show people, this is how you incorporate that. So I definitely break it down and really encourage people, don't be afraid to tell the universe what you want. But part of my course work is helping people get clear on what it is they want, number one, rather than what it is they don't want. And number two, to be coherent in thinking that all the time, but particularly in their group. You also asked me about size of groups. Now, this is the interesting thing. We tested that too, Anna. We ran one of our experiments, which was actually the first time we did it was in Australia. It was all about getting seeds to grow faster. I was working with the University of Arizona um, and their consciousness laboratory. They put together four sets of seeds labeled A, B, C, D. They sent me photos of all of those seeds. I was speaking in Sydney, Australia, uh, to an audience of about 700. So I thought, let's do an intention experiment. 
I let them choose the seeds, A, B, C, D. Um, they chose them. We did an intention. We didn't tell the scientists which ones we chose, but we told them we were finished. It's time to plant the seeds. So they planted the seeds, and five days later, they measured them. I still didn't unblind the study. Once they'd finished, I did. I said, for instance, well, they were seeds A. And it turned out, lo and behold, the seed scent intention grew significantly higher than controls. Wow. Let's just unpack this for a moment. I'm in Sydney, Australia. The seeds are in Tucson, Arizona, 8,000 miles away if you're going around the globe via California. Also, we're not sending intention to the actual thing. We're sending an intention to a photo of the thing. We're sending intention to a symbolic representation of the seeds, yet we're having an effect. Now, I said that we've tested it. That was a group of 700. I did that experiment five more times among audiences as small as 100, audiences as large as uh, thousands over the internet. So we ran it in New York in a workshop, in South Carolina in a conference, Dallas and uh, LA in conferences, and then over the internet with my audience. And I found we got the exact same outcome, no matter what the size of the audience. And the only thing that counted, that improved that, was the group I did in South Carolina, who were a group of experienced healing touch practitioners used to intention. So they were more experienced than the others and that produced a better outcome. But size doesn't matter. I have found the same outcomes, whether I have a group of eight or a group of 80,000. I'm loving it and thank you for explaining it so beautifully. So your recent work focused on the power of intention of small groups, notably the power of eight, your book and, and your project, is an interesting departure from the global intention experiments where you have thousands and thousands of people participating. So what I'm curious about is now that you've explained it, really it doesn't matter how many people focus on the same outcome. What sparked your interest in creating smaller groups of people to, to test and run those intention experiments? But also, have you tested and have you established the minimum group, the minimum number of people that when put together would create a better outcome than just one single person? So would it be two, three, four, is eight the magic number? It's really fascinating to, to unpack it. So would you please? Sure. As I explained before, it came about by accident. Just wanting to try to scale down what was going on in those big intention experiments. And by the way, they're still going on. You asked, what are the differences? Well, in the intention experiments, we are focusing on some world issue. But we're also being very specific there, too. Somebody recently asked me, can we do an intention to get all the women in the world together to stop war? And I said, that would be lovely. But in our experience, <laughs> you need to be more specific than that. So what we did, for instance, in our peace intention experiments, was focus on Sri Lanka, for instance, which was going through a civil war. And we even focused on areas of Sri Lanka that had the worst conflict. We focused on a neighborhood in, in St. Louis, Missouri, which is officially the most violent place in America. And we, you know, we focused on that. And we looked at data before and afterward um, from police statistics of violence. So we always get data. We always actually do an experiment. But it's uh, something out there. Now, with the groups, 
what I started doing was seeing if they could heal each other. And it, we started out with physical healings, but now what I teach in the courses and what I, I see all the time are healings in other parts of their lives. So for instance, I tell people to try focusing on their finances or their career or their relationships or their life's purpose as well as their health. And I'll give you a couple of wonderful examples of this. Joy, for instance, who lives in Australia, she and her group, and by the way, with my groups, when I say groups, usually they are result of um, a course of mine. So I have uh, uh, level one courses, intention essentials, and then my master class where I put people in groups myself, you know, our team does, and we follow them and work with them for a whole year. So Joy was a part of that group a year or two ago during lockdown. She intended to open up her heart to love. You know, she wanted to find a mate. So her group does this intention for her. And about a week or two later, she gets a call from a boyfriend of hers in the UK that she had 35 years ago. They start talking. They start connecting. They start essentially (laughs) a phone relationship. And he ultimately moves over to Australia. So they're moving. They're living together. She's in love. She's head over heels in love, as is he. So that's one example outside of health. I've had, you know, in health, so many (laughs) people, as I mentioned, I've had loads of stage four cancer heal. I've had two women who are losing their sight reverse that. One of them now has 20, 25 vision. We had somebody else losing her hearing that also got restored. We've had people repigment with vitiligo and so much more. But with other things, for instance, um, I had um, a woman who wanted to write a book. And she was a bodywork practitioner named Lisa. And she'd never written a book before. And she had gone through three editors working with her. And she was getting nowhere. She also was terrified of the whole prospect of marketing. So she was getting nowhere in her group. And I finally said to her, Lisa, get off of yourself. Start intending for someone else in your group who has a bigger challenge. She did. There was a woman called Diane in her group who was uh, really needed money. The very next week, she has this compulsion that she didn't understand to go into this shop. She didn't even need something from this shop on her main street. She goes in. And she sees a woman that she had once met briefly, goes over to say hello, once again, compelled to do so. And they start chatting. And it turns out that this woman is a former publisher, unbeknownst to Lisa, and now a book coach. And she hears Lisa's project. And she says she offers to coach her through the whole process. He did. And the upshot is it becomes an Amazon bestseller. Wow. These are examples like this. And, you know, I hear thousands of them from the groups in my courses and also the Power of Eight groups that have happened all over the world. You asked if there's any science about this. First of all, just empirical evidence that I've seen, eight is like a Goldilocks figure, as I like to I like to say. It's got a lot of mythology around it you know the chinese believe it's the luckiest number yeah it's a sideways infinity sign there's sacred geometry around it all of those things but for me maybe it wasn't an accident but i just said hey we'll put them in groups of eight or so and what i have discovered is sometimes people have groups of six sometimes people have groups of 12 And it works as long as it is a group of any size. What we've also discovered, though, is part of the why it works. Uh, When I was speaking at at a talk at Life University, one of the most prestigious and largest chiropractic universities in the world in Atlanta, Georgia, 
They were intrigued by the Power of Eight groups, so they offered to put their neuroscience department at my disposal. We ran a series of experiments involving student volunteers, and we measured brainwaves, putting a, an EEG cap on one member of each group. And what we discovered was that very quickly, the people had huge changes in their brain waves. Now, we had assumed, and the neuroscientist uh, team leader, Dr. Stephanie Sullivan, assumed the brainwave signatures were going to look like meditation. They looked at nothing like meditation. What they looked like were almost identical brainwave signatures to those measured by Dr. Andrew Newberg at the University of Pennsylvania when measuring brain waves of Sufi masters during chanting and Buddhist monks during ecstatic prayer. What they showed was a lowering of certain brain waves. So uh, the parietal lobes, which sit toward the back of the head, they help us navigate through space. They tell us, this is me, this is not me. They were dialed way down. So were parts of the brain like the right frontal lobes involved in worry, doubt, negativity. They were also dialed way down. These were people in a state, essentially, of ecstatic oneness. Here's the difference. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. It's really important. And so those brain waves. I suspect were a combination of theta and gamma because the gamma frequency is associated with ecstasy, with spiritual visions, etc. And theta is this very, very deep meditative state. Beautiful. They weren't they at weren't. all, Anna. They weren't <laughs> at all. <laughs> they were di all of the brain waves had lowered. So it wasn't like an increase of gamma, which is also what we expected to see. Because as you say, those are associated with moments of great insight. These were brainwaves that were turning off. So what we were seeing were not uh, individual increases. So the individual's insights, et cetera, are individually increasing. What we're seeing is individu individuality. What we're seeing was individuality turning off and being subsumed by a group effect, a state of oneness. So this is what you see also with a Buddhist monk involved in ecstatic prayer, is a subsuming into oneness. And this is what our people describe all the time, as they do on the big intention experiments too. I survey the intention experiment intendees, and I want to find out all the time, how was it for you? And they always say, I had electricity flowing inside my body. You know, I felt it. I felt tingling. I felt like I was in the tractor beam of Star Trek. And people talk about this too. They talk about almost unbearable energy in a power of eight group, whether it is a virtual one and they're just meeting on Zoom or whether they're sitting in person. Same thing with the intention experiments. So what we're actually seeing is a state of ecstatic oneness. Now, here's the interesting thing about this, Anna. We don't get to experience that. You know, we talk about being all part of this giant quantum energy field, but we don't experience what oneness is like. We experience ourselves in separation. You know, lonely people on a lonely planet in a lonely universe. You know, we don't experience it. But people talk about this all the time. They talk about the energy, feeling the energy between them and feeling this love like they've never felt it before. And that state of oneness, I think, is one of the main secret sauces here in these Power of Eight groups. When we get into that state of oneness, I think that's where healing can occur.
Absolutely. You know, Lynn, one of the most striking quotes I have ever read, beautifully encapsulating and explaining the notion that everything in the creation is connected to everything else, is by the Indian sage Ramana Maharishi. When asked, how are we to treat others? He replied, there are no others. And I just love this quote so much, which is a really nice segue to my next question, because I read this quote in the same book that I would like to to talk about in relation to a different topic. I'd like to bring something new to this conversation and perhaps to the narrative of the power of intention, as I feel it's really important and I'd love to hear your view on this. I've been studying and researching consciousness, karma, free will and destiny and the power of our thoughts and emotions for decades. And only recently I came across this completely new to me scientific explanation why sometimes our intentions to create a different reality simply don't work. And it absolutely resonates with me and makes total sense. In fact, that's what I was subconsciously expecting. And I found this jewel in the amazing book, Real Magic by Dr. Dean Radin from the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which I highly, highly recommend as this book can literally change your life. Now, addressing the question, why can't I create my own reality and make my dreams come true each and every time I use magic, meaning the power of intention? Dr. Radin says, and I quote, that's because three factors are working against you. Reality inertia, lack of talent, and the unconscious. Now, the lack of talent he's referring to is the difficulty some people have to achieve a deep meditative or focused state. The unconscious is about our unconscious beliefs that block the manifestation of our intentions, and and we know that. But the first element that he mentioned, reality inertia, is what stopped my heart. And Dr. Radin explains it in this way. The reality appears to be highly reactive to intention, but it is also elastic and fully interconnected. So when your intention warps the universe a bit here, then somewhere else a distortion is going to appear, and someone or something may not like it. So they or it will push back to repair the warp and maintain the status quo. Wow! And the classic example to illustrate this point I can think of is things like job interviews or any type of competition where say 20 or 100 people want the same thing or or outcome. So their intentions are literally fighting against one another at the energy level in the quantum field. And I have to say that for me, the penny has dropped because this explains so much for me personally in my life and in terms of my understanding of, of how this works. And why the famous law of attraction (laughs) doesn't always work in our favor, even if we remove those unconscious beliefs and other blocks, and it still doesn't work. So I'd love to hear your view on this. Such a great question, Anna. And Dean Radin, a good friend of mine, is also so brilliant. And that is a wonderful book. Well, what I see is just that, because when people come to me, they oftentimes have read, you know, the popular ideas or or films about the law of attraction. And they think, well, if I just believe, I'll receive. But it is a little more complicated than that. And as you say, there's a big pushback. I mean, an obvious example of that is war. One side wants one thing and the other side wants the other thing. Um, look at Ukraine right now. You know, the Ukraine versus the Russians. They both want something different. But what I've discovered is most of the time, people don't have real clarity about what it is they want or they're sending out. And they also give up too early. That happens a lot. Or they uh, they have unconscious issues that do block them. And Oftentimes, that's coming from their past. 
one of the things that I've been working on for a number of years now is moving intention out of time. So what we know from the information that any good quantum physicist says now, Carlo Rovelli, the famous Italian physicist, et cetera, they're all saying there's no such thing as sequential time as we understand it. In the quantum world, time is much more like one big smeared out now. So when I started thinking about that, I thought, well, wow, there's also, as scientists have demonstrated, no part of the brain that actually registers time. And it's also linked to future in the sense that somebody with amnesia finds it impossible to imagine the future. So I started thinking about all of this and thought, well, if that's the case, then how about intention back in time to clear some of those unconscious or just below the surface limiting beliefs that are affecting your intention today? And I do this, I I run retreats and things like that, where I work with people using what I call retro intention. Now, we don't change what happened. So we don't create a fairy tale. Let's say you were, you suffered some sort of trauma as a child. We don't pretend it doesn't exist. What we do, though, using intention is change the energy around that. And that's what causes most problems, which is a lack of power. So I give people back their power. You know, when you have suffered a trauma or humiliation or pain of some sort, you have lost power to the other person or other people. And so it's turning people's power. So I find that's one very good way of eliminating what is a big block. But I mentioned before the idea of giving up. One of my keys that I teach people is never give up. Do not give up. When you have that attitude, and I've seen it in, for instance, the master class where I'm working with people for a year in power of eight groups. The people who don't achieve what they want are the people who don't show up regularly, who don't who drop out after a while. The people who do show up week after week after week, they are the people, and the majority I see have extraordinary transformations at the end of the year. Now, one example was a German master class. I just spoke to them the other week. And there was one woman who said, my power of eight group is like my um, virtual first aid kit. Whenever I have a problem, I have all my power of eight groups on a WhatsApp group. I just text them and say, oh, we need intention for this. And they'll send me intention right then and there. (laughs) And it works over and over again. But someone else said something so interesting. She said her group helped her intend to get a new apartment. And she needed a specific kind of apartment with a garden or backyard because she had a dog. So she was intent and she needed space for her work, et cetera. Intending, intending for months, nothing happens. So she keeps intending. She puts an ad out there. She does all of this. Lo and behold, And she doesn't give up and she keeps focusing on it with her group. Lo and behold, she gets a call from a man offering her not an apartment, but a house that is much bigger than what she wanted, that has a whole big garden, big backyard Mm -hmm. for her dog that backs off, you know, backs onto this beautiful open space, (laughs) et cetera, and is less money than what she wanted to pay for. She moves into a fabulous house. And I think the moral of that story is she did not give up. She continued to believe in the process and work with her group. There's a final thing, Anna. The one thing we haven't really covered that I think is an essential aspect of whether or not intention becomes reality is altruism. What I have seen in the intention experiments, but also in Power of Eight groups, is the healing power of altruism. The science shows that altruism is like a bulletproof vest. People who do things for other people live longer, happier, healthier lives. In my intention experiments, as I mentioned, I survey people. 
What I find is that the people who participate in these intention experiments, particularly the peace intention experiments, start discovering healings in their own lives. First of all, they discover a, a kind of mirrored effect. People who have been part of the peace intention experiments start experiencing peace in their own lives. They make up with estranged partners or children. They connect better with their bosses and coworkers. About 40% every single time say they feel more love for everybody they come in contact with. I mean, they're hugging strangers. It's amazing. But also about a third every single time report either illnesses they have are vastly better or they're actually cured. So we see that rebound effect in the big experiments, but in the little power of eight groups, when people are stuck, invariably I will say, as I did to Lisa, get off of yourself. Start intending for someone else. And that is invariably when I see things shift for them. Beautiful. Now, Lynn, before we talk about your workshops, retreats, etc., I have just one more question. And I'd like to go into this rabbit hole. How do you reconcile the power of intention with the notions of karma and destiny? And specifically, can an intention be blocked from manifesting if it is at odds with the person's destiny or karma? And how can we tell? For example, if we have a focused intention for someone's health issue to go away, and their soul had chosen to go through this experience, potentially even ending their life through it, such as cancer, our good intention may actually interfere with the soul's journey. Or we might have an intention to improve our finances and break the cycle of financial struggle, while this could be, in fact, our soul's destiny and karma to be cleared. So there is potentially a spiritual reason why our intention may not work on top of all other potential reasons that we have already talked about. What is your take on this? What a great question. Well, we have to go back and understand how the universe works according to what we've discovered in quantum physics. So if you think about destiny, you're basically saying your path is laid out this is the way your life is supposed to go. This is the way you will learn. And you'll have all of these events happen in your life. So it's mapped out. It's predetermined, essentially. What we're understanding from quantum physics is that nothing is determined, that we are all vibrating packets of not quite something yet. At our very nethermost being, we are subatomic particles. And what um, quantum physicists have demonstrated is a thing called superposition, meaning subatomic particles aren't on anything yet. They are, Think of them as a chair in an auditorium. They're not just one chair. They're every seat in the auditorium all at the same time. They're every possible self. And what collapses them down to one single seat is the involvement, the observation or measurement of an observer. What that suggests is that our world is highly malleable. It's plastic. I like to say it's like one big batch of unset jello. And that what gets the jello to set is our involvement. We're co creators. So we are taking this, this universe of not quite something yet and affecting it with our involvement. Now intention is moving one step further from just observing to actually trying to influence. So I think that that is the answer, that essentially we are co-creators. And we, if we accept that version of life, then we take a lot more responsibility on as well. We say, ah, we're responsible in all of these situations. We're not just passive observers, we're drivers in the seat of our lives. Now, there are tough things that happen to people, of course, 
and we all learn from them. And, you know, as the saying goes, nobody gets out of here alive. I am not one of those people who believes, yeah, if you use intention, nothing bad will ever happen to you. Lots of challenges are there for us to learn. That's why we're here on earth. We're here to learn to grow. But I think that that journey we have is more malleable and that we can influence it much more than we do. So that would be my answer to it. Do I think that people who do bad things get a comeuppance, you know, as you would think in karma? I, I love that line, karma never forgets an address. Well, I think there is, a, there is an element to that. But as I say, in terms of thinking of, the, of life as predetermined, if that is your point of view, then there's no use in doing intention. Yes, I've had this conversation with with many people, including on my podcast and, and in, in my private life. And the views obviously are split, <laughs> as expected. But there is one common denominator that, that keeps coming up, and that is what you have alluded to, an empowerment, being self-empowered and accepting responsibility for your life. Now, there is that unknown element of fate or destiny over which we really have no control and what what drives us i think to in spite of that margin of uncertainty can i change this or can't i change this is that precisely we don't know so in other words as i like to say you'll never never know if you never never go I love that. I love that. <laughs> so if you don't go there, if you don't try, if you don't make an effort, you will never know whether this was something that you were able to change or not. Yeah. Let's look at it this way too, Anna. And that was so well said. I can't control. If I walk out of here today and I get hit by a bus, well, that wasn't my intention to do that. What I can control, though, is how I respond to that and my intention for that. A child who's born into poverty and illness and, and famine doesn't choose to be there, you know, at least we think. But it's how he or she responds to that that is intention and how faced with issues we respond you know, we are not responsible, essentially, you know, I, we could say, for all of the things that are going on in our world right now. You know, war in Ukraine, uh, banks collapsing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What we are responsible for is using our intention to be resilient and to come up with new ways of dealing with it, which is what I try to help people with. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. Which is, again, a very nice segue to my next question. <laughs> Could you please tell us more about your work? You do so much. You run workshops, retreats, courses, classes, groups. The scope of your work, I have to say, is fascinating. And you're doing so much. I often wonder, how do you find the time to do, <laughs> to do all this? Because it's it's really very uh, impressive and there is all this information is on your website. And obviously I will include links to that. But could you please speak to how people can engage with you, how people can connect with you? Could you please speak to your work and your offerings? Of course. So, of course, we do periodic intention experiments. They're free to anybody to join. You just have to go onto my website and, and join our community and we'll announce the next one that we're doing. Um, I run all kinds of courses at different levels. And I start out with Intention Essentials. We have a course in that coming up June 24th of this year. And 
that is teaching people all the basics of doing intention, the seven key essentials I talk about, and how to overcome fear, which is really important right now, and how to become much more resilient with intention, which is really important right now. And all the things about the right language, the right mind state, the right heart state, etc. So that's an online course. I've got an in-person retreat in fabulous Broughton Hall, which is a 16th century stately home and was the runner up for the location of Downton Abbey and is and has been the seat of many, many films. But the owners also have a great spiritual bent. So they have built this beautiful meeting place called the sanctuary um, a beautiful restaurant on on the on the three thousand acres called utopia a spa it's got a fire pit a labyrinth and three thousand acres of amazing grounds so we found this to be the perfect place for holding our retreats and we do heal your past which is, as I mentioned earlier, using retro intention and many other techniques to heal people's blocks, traumas, past hurts, all of the things and re relationships, ongoing fractious relationships, say with parents that are blocking them from their own fulfilling life. And for this, I work with my husband, Brian Hubbard, who is the author of The Untrue Story of You, who developed a whole time light technique built around the idea that time is an energy to get rid of that unwanted guest that sits there on your shoulder and affects your present. So we put our, our techniques together for this week-long event, which is happening September 4th through 8th of this year. Finally, I started a thing called the Eight Revolution because I was looking at the state of the world, Anna, and I thought, oh, my goodness, bank issues, you know, bank meltdowns and war and politicians who have no idea what they're doing and energy crises and and polarized communities and people isolated as never before. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do about this? We need an army of change makers from the ground up as every social movement starts, as Margaret Mead said. And I thought, oh, we need an army of change makers. And then suddenly thought, oh, I've got an army of change makers. I've got tens of thousands of power of eight groups meeting around the world. What if I brought them together, had them communicate with each other and gave them some free tools about how to use intention and other tools to revitalize their neighborhoods and their communities from the ground up? Because as I said, every big social movement, whether it is Martin Luther King and civil rights, Gandhi and India's independence from Britain, um, Czechoslovakia liberating itself from Soviet Union. They all started with small groups and just social change, social revolution. So that's what I thought. So we are inviting everybody, whether you're in a power of eight group or not, to just come, you just sign up. And there's a private place on my website for all the groups to meet so you don't have Facebook ads, et cetera. And I offer free tools every fortnight, every two weeks. We send out more free tools people can use. Mm. And it's all on your website. People can. It's all on my website under free tools and our courses and everything are under retreats, okay. events, et cetera, and uh, courses, lynnmctaggart.com. Beautiful. My the final question <laughs> for this amazing conversation is, what is your vision for humanity? And does it include being part of the universal community of many intelligent beings on many planets in this multiverse and beyond? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's no question that it's being drip fed now that there is life elsewhere. Uh, I certainly spoke to Edgar Mitchell many years ago, one of the astronauts, and he said it was an open secret among all of the astronauts that they had seen extraterrestrial flying objects you know, and all kinds of craft that clearly were not part of any earthbound system. 
And we, I once had, uh, and my company ran an event where we had a lot of people from NASA and British Aerospace talking about just that many years ago. There is some evidence that recently that discovered that outside of our Milky Way, which is our entire galaxy of stars, there are billions of others, billions of others, unfathomable amounts of stars out there. It was, it's almost inconceivable there isn't other life. Many people, and this isn't my particular area of expertise, but many people do talk about the idea that they are showing up trying to help us in our ignorance and in the ways that we have chosen to live our world. Um, many people in my Power of Eight groups talk about yeah. light beings being behind <laughs> them. One woman talked about feeling she had warm mitts on her knee when her group were doing intention to heal her knee arthritis. And of course, nobody was touching her knees. Are they there too? I have no idea. But what I do believe is we have to make drastic change in the way we're living. We're living according to a scientific story of competitive individualism, and it's killing us, it's killing our planet. We have to change. And that's certainly part of my work is trying to bring people together in harmony and love rather than competitive individualism. There's nothing in my work that's about individualism. And I believe that is the way forward. And if those intelligent beings are out there and they're doing it better than us, then we do sure need them right oh, now. Oh, beautiful. How beautifully said. Thank you so much. Lynn, well, this has been, again, a most beautiful and powerful and empowering conversation. Is there any final thought you would like to add to leave our audience with before we close? Yes. At this time where we all feel so powerless to change things in our world, I just want to encourage people to understand that you have an extraordinary gift. We have a gift we're all born with. And yet, as we grow from babies to small children, that gift is denied by authority figures, whether it is teachers or parents, etc., till we stop believing it. But we have vast abilities beyond our senses, our five senses. And one of the things that I've focused on is our power as creators. So never doubt you have a latent capacity to heal. And it is possible with us individually, but primarily collectively, to heal ourselves, each other, and the world. Thank you. Beautifully, beautifully said. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's been such a pleasure and honor to have you on Quantum Living. It's been my pleasure too. Thanks, Anna. I really enjoyed this too. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me, and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.